There's no thrill like discovery. Discovery Channel. Explore your world. Architecture and transportation help define daily life for everyone. But they are not designed for everyone. In our world, they are designed for people at least five feet tall. That's why, for the one in 10,000 people born with a medical condition called dwarfism, our world presents a series of challenges. It is in meeting these challenges that dwarfs stand tall. Dwarfs, or little people, have been found in historical records dating as far back as the first Egyptian dynasty. They repeatedly appear in paintings depicting biblical scenes like the birth of Jesus and his crucifixion. During the Renaissance and for centuries afterward, European royal houses featured little people. Called court dwarfs, they were considered marks of prestige. Many became close confidants of their masters and mistresses. Frequently, they even held important positions at court. By the middle of the 19th century, curiosity about dwarfs made some little people rich and some famous. Among the most famous were Tom Thumb and his wife Lavinia. The stars of P.T. Barnum's greatest show on earth, they traveled the world. In England, Queen Victoria graciously had a custom carriage built for the tiny couple. Then, early in the 20th century, positive attitudes toward little people began eroding. Some families, embarrassed by their dwarf children, sold them away to dime store museums, circus sideshows, and freak shows. Since they were now owned by others, they were often moved around as part of entertainment troops, because the modern world saw them only as exploitable show business material. Hello, hello, and welcome to the show. But actor and performer Billy Barty, himself a little person, saw much more. In 1957, Barty issued an appeal for American little people to join him at a gathering in Reno, Nevada. The 20 who showed up spent a week sharing, learning, and forming a national organization, Little People of America. Today, that organization, LPA, has 18,000 members and founder Billy Barty continues to be a revered and inspirational figure at LPA's annual meeting, an event that provides much needed support and information to those of short stature and their families. These meetings have often been the start of lasting relationships. That's what happened to Annette Lamoth and Scott Strasbach, and it led to their marriage. As the young couple awaits their first child, Annette, whose entire family is of average height, continues to work at a computer company. At 28 years old, she stands just three feet nine inches tall, but has always felt well adjusted. Like many people of short stature, Annette drives with the help of pedal extensions. The extra effort it takes to do things taller people do as a matter of course is simply part of a life in which most of her goals have been met. It was great to to have a little person. When I met Scott, it was just the most amazing thing, and you know that that was it. I think the difficult part is having um, people look at you because you're different. Then I don't think it's something that you can really prepare your child for, like saying, "Okay, people are going to look at you. It's going to happen." But just to uh, be happy with who you are. Being happy with who you are is one thing. Avoiding the frustrations of a world not sized for you is another. 32, think they'll fit? It's frustrating <laughs> to go shopping. Yeah, if you shop for clothes, you're not only just shopping for clothes, you just can't walk out of the store with your clothes on. 
Actually, they, they look pretty good. They do fit good. Yeah. You just need you gotta then get your clothes, and you gotta go spend money to get them tailored. I'd offer to bend over and help you, but I don't <laughs> think I could. Wait, Annette and Scott's baby is due in a few weeks. Genetic tests show that the baby girl will have a form of dwarfism called achondroplasia, just like her mother and father. Dr. Michael Wright studies the genetics of dwarfism at the Johns Hopkins Greenberg Center. The gene which causes achondroplasia was identified in 1994. Um, since then, a great deal has been learned about this. There are certain characteristic features of people with achondroplasia. People with achondroplasia tend to have large heads, a very particular facial profile, and distinctive limb and hand patterns. And that is the sort of almost stereotyped image of someone with achondroplasia that we recognize. There are over 150 forms of dwarfism. Achondroplasia, caused by the overactivity of the gene that inhibits growth of long bones, is just one of them. Just as any other parent, and your most important thing is that your, your baby is healthy. You, know, you, you don't um, specifically pick what you want. Um, I don't think that's fair. I don't think that's right. You know, you're, you're blessed with what you get, and you make the best of it. I'm perfectly happy with, with average size or, or little. Um, it's exciting that she is going to be little, but e either way, you, you, you hope and pray for a healthy child. I just want my child to have as much fun in life as I've had. Um, experience as much as you can experience and obey your parents. Is it cold? Like all prospective parents, Annette and Scott are thrilled and moved by the sonogram images of their growing baby. These are the kidneys right here and here. Wow, that's nice. Yeah. That's amazing. That is pretty cool. Can you see the little arms there? And I'm going to be taking a look at the bones in the forearm. You can see there's the hand right there, following yeah. it down to the wrist, and you can yep. see. Yeah. A doctor must also carefully monitor the heartbeat on a regular basis. Once the images have been seen, Dr. Judith Rossiter, a high-risk obstetrician and a geneticist, examines Annette. Dr. Rossiter's specialty is prenatal diagnosis in genetic diseases related to pregnancy. How much more she's developed is so amazing. How they start from you know cells and it's just a whole human. It, it's so yeah. miraculous. If you have a couple where both parents clearly are known to have achondroplasia, and now we can test for that with a gene for achondroplasia, their chances are very clear. They have a one in four chance of having an average stature child, which inherits the, the non-achondroplasia gene from each of the parents a 50% chance, or two out of four, of having inherited the achondroplasia gene from one parent and the non-achondroplasia gene from the other parent. And then one out of four would be at risk for inheriting the achondroplasia gene uh, from both of the parents. And if that happens, that's the homozygous condition that is of concern because it's not compatible with life. Fortunately, Annette and Scott's baby has inherited only one dominant gene for achondroplasia. The little girl is expected to be born healthy. With the happy event still a few weeks away, Scott and two of his friends, Carlton Gross and Stevie DeVecchia, are still able to jam in his basement. I had to do like a massive search to find guitars because it was like, I couldn't, it's hard to find half-size guitars. I expect people to take us seriously. Don't take us as a joke. I mean, because obviously we're not joking here. You know, this is... But there will have people laugh, you know, be like, man, yeah. who's that all that, you know? Yeah. I've had this dream of starting this little person band for a long time, and it's obviously hard because, first of all, A, is to find a little person, and B, to find a little person that plays music, it's, it's a difficult thing. Um, yeah, I lucked out to have two musicians live a minute away from me, and it happened to be little people, um, my friend Carlton and my friend Steve. Ah! 
Joshua. Susie and Mark Campbell are short statured. Their son Joshua isn't. He'll grow to an average height. What will this mean for a three foot ten inch mom and a four foot seven inch dad? There will definitely come a time when he will realize, wait a minute, something's different here. Mommy and daddy are smaller than other mommy and daddies out there. We're just going to have to be very open and upfront with him about it and not apologize for anything and just explain the way it is. And there's going to be times that we're going to be walking around with him when he's like four or five and there's going to be kids who are going to stare, point, laugh at us, do whatever. I cannot let him know that it bothers me because if it bothers me, sure. he's going to feel it. He's going to feel the effect of it. I'm sure he'll ask why and I'm just going to tell him the same way my mother told me. That's the way God made me. God makes all of us special. There's no mistakes. Everybody has a parent that is different in some way. You may not always be able to pick him up to give him love or whatnot. Well, we're going to have to go down to his level and give him love on the floor. You know, I'll sit, that, sit down on the floor and let him come to me, and that'll work. So. All I wanted was a happy, healthy baby. And I know a lot of parents say that, but that's all I pray for. Swing up. You're such a big boy. Yay, Joshua. Most little people are born to average size couples. For many of them, having a child of short stature comes as a shock. It did to Michelle and Joe Buckingham. I think the first maybe two days were the hardest. I've heard it described as sort of a grieving process where you've already had these expectations of what your child's going to be like and then you have to change those. But we realized that that was our problem, not his. There you go. I just thought he was different looking. I don't think that there was anything, quote unquote, the matter with him when, we first, when he was first born other than he had a big head, which was the main concern that most of the people at the hospital had. But I think Michelle had some inkling as to what was going on pretty much right away. And they had doctors coming in and looking, you know, measuring his head, and he had an ultrasound done on his head to make sure that there weren't any problems. And they just said, well, I guess he just has a big head, you know. When he would go in for his checkups, we would mention different things we noticed to the doctor, and they would, you know, like he had a curve in his back, which we found out later is normal for babies with achondroplasia, but the doctor said, oh no, see, when you hold him up, the, it, it straightens out, and that sort of thing. So, you know, pretty much we figured we were imagining things. I had um, looked up dwarfism, different kinds of dwarfism, and he had a lot of features for achondroplastic dwarfism and that we were going to take him to see the geneticist and if that didn't clear things up then we would go ahead to the neurosurgeon because from what I had read um, a large head was perfectly normal in a chondroplastic dwarfism and he wasn't probably going to need a neurosurgeon. The diagnosis of dwarfism can be difficult. It can be particularly difficult for those who do not normally see people of short stature. It has to be said, however, that even those who spend a lot of their time doing this often find it very difficult. And that can be difficult to explain to parents that it is not always possible to make a definitive diagnosis at an early stage. I went in at least not knowing what it could be. And then having the geneticist come in and tell us that he was a dwarf, it's like, you know, you get images of circuses and, you know, that kind of thing going through your mind. The only dwarfs I had ever seen up to that point were in movies where a person with dwarfism was portrayed as some sort of other species like um, Willy Wonka where they were the little guys in the factory or the Wizard of Oz, you know, the munchkins. Colin is a well-adjusted first grader, but he has special needs and his school system has met them. 
They put a shelf in his locker, uh, an extension on the handle. They changed the handles on all the doors. They changed faucets. They provide stools, special equipment for the bathroom, and so forth, so that he can uh, be, again, independent and not have to ask for help. His chair with special footrest because he can't have his legs dangling when he's working. He does everything that the other kids do. He does um, the math, the materials, the hands-on materials. He spreads out work on the mat like other kids do, or he'll work at his desk. He does not really like to write. Colin has a problem writing because his hands are small, and it is difficult for him to hold a pencil firmly enough to make consistent contact with the paper. But that is simply an obstacle to be overcome. Michael. Even at his tender age, Colin has learned a lot about obstacles and overcoming them. I wish all my students came to me uh, with, with the kind of self-esteem that he has uh, that enables him to deal with problems that may arise without uh, being unduly hurt. I think this comes from the home. The, the five or six years before they even come to school, that he feels accepted, valued for himself. That, I think, will persist throughout his life. Colin's older brother, Justin, is of average height. He's always there for Colin. A big brother of a little person. I help him sometimes when he needs help, like I help him get his toothbrush ready. And he can't reach the sink. Even with the stool, he can't reach the faucet to turn the water on. And he has a hard time getting the lid off the toothpaste because his hands are so small. I started noticing when he was in preschool. Even though the kids are small, you can still kind of tell. And even now, I notice a lot more because people talk to me about him calling midget and big head and stuff. I wish sometimes he could do taekwondo like I do. I think it might be nice to have someone hit like him as an opponent. Let yourself in, dude. I can. Yes, you can. He's not a midget. His head's just that way because his body's smaller. His head just looks big. It's not really big. It's normal size, but since he's got such a small body, it looks like he's got a bigger head than he really does. I think his major challenge is going to be other people's attitude toward people with dwarfism. Because I know I think that was my first hurdle, was getting over the stereotypes that you have as far as who they are or what they are, or, you know, why they're different or whatever. And if you don't know, you don't know. And until you become more involved with people with dwarfism, you, you only have certain ideas that, of how they are and what they can do. But I think that, you know, that he's a determined little boy and he's going to do what he wants to oh, do. Oh, you going to give me a kiss? I wouldn't say my expectations for him now are just as high as they were when he was born. There's nothing he can't do. There's nothing he can't do if he wants to do it. Two weeks before the birth of their son, Will, Evelyn and Eric Goldman found out that the baby would have a form of dwarfism. In this period of time, in this two weeks before he was born, we went to a baseball game, Eric and I. We were trying to do very normal things. This was our first child. We were older parents. We, we were just trying to take it all in, and the unknown is more worrisome in some ways than anything. And we went to this baseball game to the Orioles, and I remember sitting in the stadium and thinking there were 40,000 people there, and that I was the one who was picked, because this happens in one in 40,000 births or one in 80,000 births, depending on what we had been told. And I thought, gee, I, I got, I'm chosen here. I have spent a great deal of time worrying about his physical threats to him. Will is athletic. I've always felt that this is somewhat ironic, that here a person who could be on the same level playing field in so many realms of life has as his passion sports where he's not on the same level. When he played soccer up until around the third grade, uh, when he would get injured, I remember him having my heart in my throat every time he would fall on the ground. My dad views me more as a dwarf, I think, than I do. I mean, I just try to live my life as normal as possible, not thinking about it. I think his concerns are most, mostly about my safety. I want to do a lot more stuff than he lets me do, I think. It's okay with me because I like him worrying about me like that sometimes. 
I do worry about the way the world views differences. I remember us reading, starting to read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe to Will, and it was very difficult because the dwarfs in the book are not humans. And we had to stop because I couldn't explain this negativity in the literature, and there's a lot of negativity out in the world. But on the other hand, this is a child who embraces life. And so we recognize that, sure, there's a possibility of all of this. My mom has a, a pretty much the same approach as me, just trying to handle life as normal as possible. But I know inside of her, she's caring, really, too. But she's just not showing it as much as my dad. Obviously, in many ways, he is like all other people. But, for example, he and his participation in sports measures himself against people who have much longer legs, who are much faster than him, who have longer arms, who do not have back problems. I feel sometimes that he doesn't understand that he is different to that extent. He seems to be less aware of how different he is than we think he is different from other people. Whether that's denial or not, I don't know. It's certainly, whatever it is, is working for him to this point. I don't think he's in denial at all. I think he's in life. I just think he is who he is. And from the very beginning, the language mattered to me because he is a boy with a form of dwarfism. Don't make him anything other than what he is. That's who he is. He's a boy. Contrary to popular belief, there are some advantages to short stature. Once someone has met you, they'll always remember you. The first time I ran for mayor, uh, everyone in the community knew who I was. Lee Kitchens was a highly successful engineer. When he retired, he ran for mayor of Ransom Canyon, Texas, and was elected. A tireless advocate for little people, Lee has become an inspiration for many. Here in the United States, we're modifying the environment to fit the people. Now let me show you what we do to adapt a house or to build one. You can just hit the light switches, they're there where people can reach them and average size folks don't have a problem. Well, let's go take a look at the rest of the house. Lee has a form way. of dwarfism called spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia, or SED, a condition that makes walking increasingly difficult with age. Well, in the kitchen, we try to lower all the counters so that <clears throat> I can reach the counter, reach the vent hood, and uh, lower the oven. Uh, and you almost have to uh, open the door on the floor, but that's necessary in order to be able to get this where I can reach it and then be able to reach the microwave. Well, in the bathroom, there's several things we can do. One is you can get lower tubs so it's easier to step over, especially when you've got short legs. And then the bathroom counter is much like the kitchen counter uh, with the mirror down low where I can see it. Uh, so I can reach all the controls and everything. Then the shower has two shower heads one for me and one for everyone else. Back in the 30s and the 40s and the early 50s before LPA, you were, you were developing um, your own self-image uh, uh, in isolation. It's not like that anymore. Regional LPA meetings like this one bring together little people and their families to socialize and talk about topics of mutual concern. Like I said, the finished model will be varnished. Will be the, will be probably the only real change to this design. Monica and Neil Pratt got married over 10 years ago. Monica works at home and is responsible for the most comprehensive database of little people in the country. Managing some 18,000 names is a full-time job. Often she answers over a dozen requests for information a day. Like Lee Kitchens, 
Monica has SED, and like him, she has adapted her work environment to her extremely short stature. Hey, Monica, you got a stopping point? Yeah. How about we get some supper? Sure. Understandably, this couple attracts many stares. At the time that I met him, I was kind of um, doing the party scene, stuff like that, and um, he was telling me about the Bible, and I was kind of thinking, been there, done that. We had built up a relationship without any mention of romance, and, and, um, and it was very pleasant, very enjoyable. Her mother later told us that she thought I just wanted to get attention for myself, that that was why I proposed to Monica and so forth. We are still in the process of considering children. I was told that it would be difficult for someone of my extreme short stature. Most little people, most dwarves, are around four foot tall, and most of them can have children. Um, for myself, the smaller you are, the greater the risk. Uh, for myself, I have spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia, which we call SED, and uh, it's a multi-random genetic mutation. So we could be anywhere from the smallest uh, two foot eight that I am, maybe there might be a few smaller ones, all the way up to five feet tall. Of course, you're going to get looks and stares and even some comments and questions. And you just expect it. People often come up and ask her age. They ask me as if she can't speak for herself. And, uh, and then, you know, is that your daughter? Is that your sister? You know, everybody, we get all kinds of strange questions. I think it's a lot easier for me because I grew up this way. And uh, depending on the person that approaches me is how I gauge my answer. If I saw another couple, just like me, I'm afraid I was there and I would want to talk to them the same. Leah Smith, a West Texas teenager, knows she's different, but to her, it's no big deal. Everyone's different. Everyone has something different about them. No one is the same, but um, some you can just see. I've grown up with these kids since elementary, so they've all pretty much gotten to know me. and. It's kind of funny to me sometimes when all of a sudden they bring something up about me being little and it's like they just noticed it and I'm like, hello. <laughs> There's a story when I was about four years old and I had gone to um, Sunday school and they had said all living things grow and I thought, well, mom's told me that I wasn't going to grow, you know, all living things grow that God made. So I went home and I asked mom, I said, all living things grow and she said, well, she said, yeah, that's true, but you're special, so you're not going to grow as much. And I was like, oh, okay. And I went and played, and then um, she came in there and told me to go pick up my toys. And I said, no, I'm special. Away from school and home, Leah is still special, but not always so protected. At work and elsewhere, she's experienced prejudice as a result of being different. I remember one time a man came up to me and well, he was walking by and he just started laughing, just laughing hysterically. And then he was on the ground laughing. And it, I was like, at first I thought, what's he laughing at? And then I realized he was laughing at me. And you're like, well, what's wrong with me? Why are you laughing at me? And then you have to realize that you are different, but it's not something they should laugh at. When that man came up to me in Tamar and told me, that God wouldn't make something like this. Um, I th it really made me question my faith and really made me question everything. But I believe that, that God did make me and, um, and He made me special. And, and um, I don't think I'm a mistake and, and anything like that. But yeah, it's really helped me to realize that I am, that God made me. I'm not just something that happened. Adam Brown, a student at Texas Tech University and a competitive power weightlifter, is the youngest of three children. The other two are of average size. I remember when I was a um, young child, when I finally realized I was a little person, kind of broke down in tears, you know, wondering why I was so short. 
talk to my mom, you know, just cry all over, you know, why am I so short? You know, because people were making fun of me. I'm, I'm glad I noticed when I was young that I was different than everybody else. It was tough. It was, I mean, in high school it was really tough for me because all my other friends, you know, would go out, you know, on dates and everything. And I think, I mean, not to be, I mean, discriminated, but I think the girls, you know, they weren't, just saw me as a friend, but never could really see me as a, as a boyfriend. And I think they were, not that they were scared, they just didn't want to, like, hurt my feelings and just want to still be friends. A fair is a great place to hang out for good friends like Leah and Adam. We talk to each other all during the year, and um, we just have a special kind of bond. You know, I see Leah all the time, and, you know, through, since she's in Lubbock, and you know, we hang out and, and just you know, have a good time. Leah and Adam's friendship began after they met at a West Texas LPA meeting. Relationships like theirs are difficult for little people who are a small percentage of the population and often live far apart. They are not dating each other, but for most little people, dating comes with a unique set of issues. I've made it real clear that I just date LPs. Mom tells me I'm prejudiced against tall people, but not necessarily. Little people have to live in two worlds. They have to live in the small world, and they have to live in the big world. And the world is not going to, going to adapt to suit us. So we have to learn to deal with uh, being little yourself uh, and accept it, and that's the first thing. And then you have to learn to live in the big world and accept what uh, the big world, uh, or how they look upon you. Once a year, for the week of the LPA convention, little people don't have to deal with the big world. They're free to enjoy life on their own terms. Here, their point of view is the one that counts. This is my best friend and his daughter from Oregon. Some people say we see eye to butt in the average light world, but here we see eye to eye. Okay, you guys, you ready? Everybody be real tall. Hold it. It's a little easier here because they're more of your height and more of your skill level. But at home, it's they're all tall. You gotta really work a lot harder. For a few days, athletic competition is intense in team and individual sports. Adam is used to working hard. He is here to test his powerlifting prowess against other little people. Ultimately, he wants to compete in the Special Olympics. When I came in on my first lift, I was lifting uh, 185, and that was my first lift. We each had three lifts, and I and I came in 185 just to you know, kind of a little warm up just to see where I am. But when I first got on the bench, you know, they um, had to show my arms where how far I go up, you know, for my press. And I went up there, and then I did my press. But when I came down, I didn't touch my chest where we're supposed to. But the, so I, I'm instead I came halfway and then up, and they said you had to go all the way down. So. So a determined Adam psychs himself up for another lift. Tight. Tight, buddy. Wait for the command. Come on, Al. Stay tight. Well, here we go. Hold it. Start. Go! Come on, Adam. Go, 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 go! Watch it! There it is. That's it. On my second lift, I did um, 205, and that was just, you know, piece of cake there. Now, with his competitive juices flowing, Adam approaches the bench for his third and final attempt. Come on. 
start. Oh, oh. Yeah. Yeah. Start. Go! Oh. Oh. I'm at third lift on 220. I I came all the way up, but my left arm wasn't all the way up, you know, because I'm I'm because you have to be parallel I and mean, straight up, you know, for a good lift. But my my left arm wasn't all the way up, but I mean I made it, but you know I was I, mean, I was happy where I was. So it was a good you know it was a good day of lifting and had a lot of fun. The most fun aspect of being here was being with all the competitors and having a fun time, meeting new friends and stuff. This is a chance for Will to excel. And I think that by participating in these dwarf games, he has a chance to excel in a way that he doesn't have the opportunity in the average sized world. It's nice to come here, you know, that everyone's in the same boat, so you've not got to worry about inhibitions or anything. You, just, you can relax and be yourself. You haven't got anything to prove and just have a good time. From France, England, Canada and other countries all over the world, people of short stature have made the meeting a popular destination. Little people of British Columbia has grown. Sometimes we forget that there are little people all over the world. Sometimes in a sense of good humor among ourselves, saying that if you see a dwarf, in one country, and you see the same type in another country, you know they're feeling much like you are. Even if you can't communicate in language, you understand what their problems are, and there's an instant bonding there. We have an association in England as well, but it's very small by comparison. There's only about 200 members or so, so it's, it is very small. Indianapolis was my first convention, and I went there, and there was thousands of little people in this hotel, and I was like, Oh my gosh, looking at everyone, obviously the, the, one of the first thoughts that comes into your mind is, wow, that's what I look like, I look like that. And it's like, you look at people from behind and you think, that's what I look like from behind, or from the side, or different angles. And so it's really strange and, to look at people, and I find myself staring, which I shouldn't do because I don't like other people staring at me, but you just can't help yourself. We have two chips, and then our waists are always smaller than yeah. our, our yeah, hips. Yeah, because I wear like size 34s, 32s or 34s, and yeah. it's just, when you get them past the Area, yeah, they're, there's they're bubble they're Shopping for clothes isn't easy for little people. That doesn't phase Leah and Tara, who are determined to be in the convention's upcoming fashion show. Can kind of help me get it on. Before going shopping, Leah agrees to wear a camera specially mounted on a helmet to show her perspective. With the fashion show only hours away, the trick is to find something ready to wear. Our blessing this year was the new fashion that came in called Capri. Capri's. <laughs> Major blessing, because they fit us as pets. Oh, there's like no altering. Unexpected success. Matching dresses that fit each of them. Yeah, yeah we have. Tara J. Oldmark and Leah D. Smith. And would you please, uh, floral Hawaiian knee-length spaghetti strap dresses of blue. I believe they just went shopping this afternoon and purchased these dresses. They were ready to wear, and that's really unusual, often unusual for us. The extraordinary week is almost over. For many little people, the goodbyes they'll soon be saying actually begin the countdown to next year's meeting. But no LPA convention would be complete without the annual talent show. Talent shows, fashion shows, and sporting events are important parts of the meeting, but not the only parts. Workshops and seminars on medical, legal, and other issues relevant to little people are conducted throughout the week. Still, for teenagers and singles of short stature, the gathering is a rare and eagerly awaited opportunity to socialize. It's kind of like a hookup week. You know, you meet new people and you know become good friends, and then and, you know just hook up, hook up for the week. There's some people that go through about five or six dudes, and I'm. 
It, it makes absolutely no sense to me how in a week's worth of time you can fall in love five times. There's a tough time in the teen years when uh, you get left out of sports, uh, social interplay, dating. Uh, and in my years, uh, we didn't have LPA. Uh, you were there all by yourself. I never knew another little person until I was 18 years old. We often wondered, uh, would we ever meet someone that we could marry, with someone our size? And, and then you come here and you see a thousand people. It does broaden the possibilities. I'd rather date a little person, but you only see them once a year, or the phone bills get too high, or it's just very difficult. It's like um, coming to a little village just full, of, just full of small people so you can forget about everyone staring at you, and you do feel more relaxed and, and more free, and you, and you feel like you've got no worries. You just escape from reality for a week or so, even though you know, it's a false environment because you know it's not going to last at the weekend. You go back home to normality again, back, back to the misery of everyday life or so. So it is, it is fun to just come away and escape and like live in a fantasy for a week because that's, that's what it really feels like. An average sized person can look at a distorted image in an amusement park mirror and then step away from it. Little people don't have that luxury. Their stature is permanent. Now, however, a surgical procedure that can lengthen arms and legs is changing that for some. At the Maryland Center for Limb Lengthening and Reconstruction, Dr. Dror Paley and his colleagues are known for this procedure. The procedure is a method to lengthen arms or legs by cutting the bone and putting on an external device that pulls the bones apart at a very slow rate, a millimeter a day, 25th of an inch a day. And bone being a living substance grows as soon as you break it to heal itself. And we trick the bone by pulling it apart, a small amount, the bone makes new bone to fill the gap and we pull it a little more. And you do this over weeks and months, you can grow a fair amount of new bone. My name is Christopher Corey Connor. I am 16 years old. I had my first operation when I was 11 years old. K.C. Connor has completed the entire process and can now work a physically demanding summer job like any average sized teen. This x-ray shows the external fixator in place. This is the lengthening device. And the patient actually turns a knob on this central screw section, which pulls these sets of pins apart. These pins are actually screwed right into the bone. You can see how the threaded screws at each end. And as this pulls apart, the bone was broken here and has been pulled apart. But it, from this point to this point, is all new bone that has grown in. The way I knew when to turn and how to turn was that they had like, um, it was usually like the screw was a six-sided screw. And they say, turn it a quarter turn. So I would turn a cord turn, or they had the four size screws, and I had to do that at four, and they had a schedule. And I usually did it at like when I woke up in the morning, at lunch, at dinner time, and when I went to bed. So about four times a day. They had three uh, big screws up here, and three up here, and then they had like this bar that was right here where uh, the pins were here, and then the part where you lengthen was right here. This small amount of lengthening the bone and the soft tissues can keep up with. If you went any faster, the patient would have pain and would develop all kinds of complications. By increasing their stature, and a lot of these patients you're taking from about four feet tall to five feet tall, you uh, are uh, normalizing uh, their ability to function with objects in society, light switches, um, uh, hanging up coats in a closet, using public phones and toilets. All of these things in our society are actually been designed around a minimum height of about five feet. Altogether, I have gained 12 inches on my legs and I've gained four inches on my arms. Their arms and legs are now of normal proportion. To the majority of the population, it's difficult to tell that they're achondroplastic. They have some facial features that are still evident and um, but it's amazing how little those facial features are obvious when the rest of the body doesn't seem to match. It's like the world was really meant for our size people like cars were meant for our size people, houses, uh, schools, 
stores, restaurants. I can reach things. I can drive a car regularly. I can use the facilities and like public restrooms a lot easier. And it's worth it. I mean, it might take about four years out of my life, but affect the rest of my life. The operation is very expensive and demands a multi-year commitment. It's not for everyone. But it was for another little person, Nicholas Sacco, an athletically gifted eight-year-old. The decision to do the procedure was motivated by his mother's desire to help him fit in. We first found out about Dr. Pele when Nicholas was two years old. So we had a few years to think about whether we wanted to do the surgery or not. He wants to be, wanted to be, just like everybody else. He has a lot of friends on our street that he needed to keep up with. And the surgery has helped him to do that. And he feels really good about himself that he went through this and he came out. He's very proud of himself right now. I felt vindicated when Nicholas informed me a few months ago that the children on the playground have stopped teasing him. At that point, I decided we had done a good thing. I think that everyone has to make that decision for their own children and you have to make the decision that's right for your family and it may not be right for everybody. God put you on this earth this way. Don't, yeah, yeah, don't mess with it. Don't let medical people that think, you know, stretch your bones or whatever they are because that's what they can do. I'm a dwarf. I was born a dwarf. I'll always be a dwarf. No matter if I lengthen my legs or lengthen my arms, I'm still a dwarf. I accept who I am. I don't, I, I don't need that. I think his body's beautiful. I think dwarf bodies are gorgeous, and I would never support him having that procedure done just to look more like an average-sized person. We've never considered limb lengthening surgery for Will. His self-esteem, his view of himself, his, the confidence he has in him is based on who he is as a person, not on what he looks like or that he should be looking better than the way he looks. I still am a little person. I'm not a tall person still. I'm only about five foot one, five two. I still have all the physical features of a little person, like my arms being short, my hands, my back, and everything else. And I don't picture myself as a sellout or anything else. And then people come up to me and say, are you a little person? And I'll come out and say, yes, I'm a little person. I'm not saying I don't want to be a little person, Just I just need to be a little bit taller. The real world. For many little people today, a kinder, gentler world. Yet still a world learning to measure a person's worth not by size alone. It's ironic that today, after being privileged to serve in, in this position as commissioner of the EEOC and having meetings with many of the law firms that um, when I was a law student at Harvard, would, wouldn't even give me a second interview, who are now beating down my door to want to have me as, as a part of their firm. There are a lot of other people, little people, who are starting out, don't have the fancy degrees that I might have, and who really struggle with discrimination, not because they can't do the job, not because they need all sorts of changes or accommodations in their job, but just because of the stereotypes and the myths and the biases that they may have against somebody who looks different, who, who's a dwarf. And when we go out in public, um, he, again, he worries about my safety, not so much the stairs. But if somebody should think that I'm just, they just want to have me and take me home. Which, I'm not that heavy and I wouldn't be able to fight them off. So, yeah, I think he worries about that. In, in England, pe people are more bitter. And th they are more, because this English sense of humor is sarcastic anyway. So people think it, it's big and clever to make fun of um, people with any kind of uh, obvious physical disability, so I find that I, I do get people making fun of me more at home than what I do here. We've um, educated as many people as we can about why Colin's little, because I know people are going to be curious. I'm curious when I see somebody who looks different. We're not freaks. We're not. Um, we're not clowns. We're we're just normal people. We live ordinary lives. We're just like everyone else. We just shorter 
we have the same dreams and aspirations and desires and wants and problems uh, that everyone else does. And they're sometimes magnified by our short stature and the attitude of the public. But uh, we're just like everyone else. I think Will and all of these kids and people with any sorts of disabilities are very brave in this world, which is not all that accepting of differences. For many, such as our son, who are in a world of average-sized people, I think that the experience is a very private one. And I don't know what it's all about, but I have a great deal of respect for whatever it is that it is being overcome. Our lifestyle is the same, but there's a few things to help it along the way. With the few more spices. Baby day has come and gone for the Strauss box. The surprise was that little Gretchen arrived two days before a planned cesarean section. Now, six days after the birth, Scott and Annette, already old hands at parenting, return from an appointment with the pediatrician. And she's more perfect than I can imagine. She's the most beautiful baby I've ever seen. She was um, on the lower end of the, the chart in, in height. Um, head circumference, she was right on target. And, but she was just a little bit littler than, than the average. She, she's a little, little person, but she has a real big heart. <laughs> as a newborn, most little people um, had the same characteristics as a, an average size baby, except just for the head, and that's why they, they measure the head, just to make sure. To the trained eye, to tell that she's a little person, or some of the characteristics as a little person, is that her, you can already tell that her, her uh, when she puts her hand together, her hands part in the middle, common characteristics of a little person, and her fingers already do that, which is really kind of neat. I'm so, so excited that she's with us. I think the world needs to be filled with more little people.